Hello and welcome to Do It Yourself Musician. Today we're going to take a look at this Roland DEP5 multi effects unit. I own several of these. This is the latest one I bought off eBay. I love this unit for the reverbs in it, especially. They're, they're just amazing, characterful reverbs. I bought this one as an as is unit, it, mostly just because it looks to be in really good condition. There's not a lot of rack rash on it. There's a little bit here and there, but not a lot. And it was at a good price. It had to make an offer on it and it was being sold by one of those kind of, I don't know, like an estate sales type of thing. It wasn't an audio uh, seller. So I kind of put in a bit of a low ball price on it and they took it. So I, I got it and they said it had been pulled from a operating studio environment. So I figured there's a good chance that this is going to be an okay shape. And as you can see, I've already popped the lid off of it here. And the reason for that is, is because when I got it, uh, the first thing I noticed is that the power button was smashed into the front panel and it wasn't like that in the eBay photos. What I found out was that it had just actually separated back here. These things will pull apart in a couple of areas. It, it probably shifted in, in transport and shipping and, and got pushed in. And I was able to get it back out and it does, it functions fine. There's really nothing wrong with that at all. So then I proceeded to plug it in, turn it on and try it out. It came on, it seems like processors working fine and everything like that. Uh, bypass signal was great except I got nothing in the unit. I heard the relays throw, which they're here, and they're, they were a bit slow and sounded out of time to me. And I got nothing out of the unit. It was just, I, I got nothing. <laughs> so, so I've been poking around in it just to try to, to figure out whether this thing is trash or not, and I was gonna try to send it back. But poking around in it a little bit, trying a few things out, I did get it to, pass a signal. It is passing a signal. The relays seem, I don't know if they're gummed up or they're just old or whatever, but they seem a bit slow and out of time. And, but they do seem to actually be getting faster the more I turn the thing on and off. Maybe it just hasn't been used in forever. I don't know. But the real big problem with it is, is these jacks, they're, they're uh, loose and you have a, a cable stuck in here and it hangs and you're audio level jumps up and down on it. So, and that's actually not very good news because uh, I personally have been unable to find these input output jacks for these units. Roland doesn't sell them anymore. I found ones very similar to this. These are sort of a ganged, a dual ganged unit on each side, but these have a particular switching system in them. Uh, when you uh, insert a quarter inch plug, one of them takes it out of bypass. And if you insert a quarter inch plug in the other side, it will put it into stereo mode and kind of the same thing on mono or, or stereo output too. So there's a different sort of internal switching. These things have nine contacts on uh, under each uh, input output uh, section. So there's uh, like 18 under this one and 18 under this one, I believe. And actually, there might be less on the output, but so if you know where to find these with the exact right switching, let me know. Of course, I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely uh, take a look at that. But so yeah, so where we're at now is that I found out the unit, it does operate. It's not critically broken, except for the problem that this jack is gonna, these jacks are gonna, give me. And one other thing that I want to show you here that I found when I opened it up. Yeah, there's a big stain on the, the bottom of it. Uh, you know, makes you wonder what lost its guts in there. So upon looking around, I discovered that the, uh, the battery is toast. It's a CR, uh, 20, three volt battery and it just released its guts. It was completely dead. I'm sure that was contributing to some of the problem of it not wanting to, to operate right. So I think what I want to do with this is number one, we will put a new battery back in it. Number two, take a closer look at these relays 
I've tried to service these before and you have to be very careful. They really don't take good to servicing. <clears throat> I do know that I can get a replacement for these though. So we're probably gonna just look at doing that. Uh, and beyond that, I'm gonna look at a solution, a couple of different solutions for maybe fixing these jacks by either trying to just actually fix uh, these things, which I've tried doing that before. I've tried taking these apart to fix them and that's not a good idea. Uh, it doesn't really work, but I've got another idea of how I might go about doing that. If that doesn't work, then I'm gonna look at possibly trying to just replace these with some other kind of jack or whatever, figuring out some other way to switch it. So first thing, let's uh, just replace that battery. So, and I do have some, uh, some replacement uh, CR2032s here. Three volt batteries. I had to get, I had to order these in from eBay from China, uh, which is interesting because the, uh, the bottom of it uh, has the two pins. It's hard to see with that QC sticker on there. Let me get that off there. This has the two pins that are side by side on it. And when I go to Mauser or DigiKey or anything to try to find this particular uh, battery with this pin arrangement, I never can find them. <laughs> so if you guys have been ordering these from Mauser or DigiKey, let me know what part number it is because the ones I find always have the offset legs on them and I, the, I've never seen what that fits in. 99% uh, of the electronics that I work on have this, yet I can't seem to find this uh, from a U.S. seller. Anyways, I got these. They're, they're good, brand new. Uh, we'll go ahead and pop it in there, solder it in. Okay, if you look down here, you can see that the, uh, the spot where the bat goes. It's very clearly labeled bat, plus, minus here. And uh, here's a little shot of the battery that we're going to be putting in cr2032 3 volt and all you got to really do is make sure that you get uh, plus minus the right way around which is going to be this way it's a li little wider than these uh pins are but yeah it's going to sit like that Obviously, I'll have to flip it over to solder it in. Okay, we're looking at the bottom of the PCB now. And for these kinds of things that, that are not going to stay in there uh, by themselves, if you turn it upside down, I like to just put the unit on its edge and uh, solder in one. One lead. And then check and see, check and see how if it's standing vertical, like that. Just get it seated properly. And then go ahead and solder the other side. And I know I'm using a ginormous tip here. <laughs> Bit hard working around the camera. I'm just going to nip these a bit. Just a bit long. And there's a close up shot of the battery installed the right way around. All right, now we'll go ahead and check this voltage. And just in case you're wondering, yes, I did check it before I soldered it in, but I just want to check it to show you guys and there it is 3.327 that's good all right let's have a look at those relays here's a look at the two relays that the uh, DEP5 has in it they as you can see they're Matsushita they're DS2VM DC12V you can uh, pop these covers off um, I've done it before to clean 
the contacts in there, do a little lubrication. You have to be extremely careful with that though. You can easily damage these things. They're, they're really not meant to be serviced, I don't think. Uh, but you can, you can give it a shot if you absolutely had to. I'm gonna go ahead and apply power to the unit. Let's, uh, let's look at these and see, and also listen to them closely to see what they do. Let's see if they're they should they should click together instantaneously instantaneously. Now I'm gonna put power on. Okay, that was a clear illustration of what's happening. Did you see this one through before that one did? And they're very they're very slow and laggy. They're usually a little quicker to throw. And they're they're snappy. They they go together and they go fast. Those are just kind of clunk clunk. Uh, I want to try it one more time. They're good at turning off. All right, let me apply power again. All right, see that was better. That's what I'm talking about. It seems like the more I operate them, the better they get. But I mean, this thing, I think, has been just sitting up for a matter of hours since I was last uh, working on it, and it's the relays are already mistimed, or they're slow to activate. Yeah, and it just happened again. So, so my thoughts are to uh, go ahead and replace these, because I believe that I, I know of the re replacement for these. It's the same part number. It's not called Masashita anymore, uh, but it's DS2V. Uh, this M designation is different. I can't remember what it is, but we'll look at that in a second. It really is the same relay. It just it's in a yellow box. It's not clear. Uh, there's also this part number crosses over to an Omron part number. So let's take a look at those, and we'll have to order these up to change them. I don't have any of these in stock. Okay, I'm on the screen capture now and I'm looking around trying to find a replacement for that relay, which was a DS series relay. Uh, the part number was DS2V, as in Victor, M DC 12V. Could not find a data sheet on that relay. I did find a fairly old data sheet on it though. That's what we're looking at right here. And this data sheet shows a DS2E as an Eric MDC12V. And, and if you look up here at this part number, it's a DS series relay. And then the this you know, well, you know, two for the, the two form C is what, what type of relay it is. It's the, the footprint of it. In E, we have an E instead of a V, just calls it an amber sealed type relay. Whereas the relay that's in the DEP5 is not a sealed relay and obviously it's clear. So I think that's really the only difference between this part number and the one that's in. We have the M designation, so we're looking for a 400 milliwatt uh, operating power. Uh, we don't have this L2 designator because that's for a latching relay. This The relay that's in there in a unit is a non-latching relay, so this doesn't it's not a part of the part number. And then of course DC 12 volts is, is what the relay is rated at. And uh, it does not have reverse polarity, it's normal polarity. So looking down here, uh, here's our part number DS2EM DC 12V. Again, it's the M type uh, 400 milliwatt. And scrolling down, we can see Here's our M type, here's a 12. And we have a coil resistance of 360. So let's go look at the one that's currently installed in the DEP5 and see if it's close to that. I bet you it is. Okay, let's measure the resistance of these relay coils. Should be across these pins here. It's the world's slowest meter. That's uh, 353 ohms. Uh, the other one, I believe, is this one. Whoop. Uh, 
and that one's 351 ohms. Okay, so that tells us there that uh, what our, our coil resistance is, uh, so we can get a closer match on a, a more modern relay. Okay, so 350 ohms thereabout is what we have in there. So this looks like the the proper uh, relay that goes in the unit. I would, I would say almost definitely this is a uh, replacement for that. However, this relay is not currently available. This was discontinued around 2014 or 2015, and it was re replaced by a DS2ES DC12V, which you can see right here. Uh, that is a uh, high sensitivity type, uh, 200 milliwatt. And coming down here, we can see it right here is the S type. Um, actually, it's up here, this one, the S type. Uh, DS2E. Am I looking at that? No, I'm not looking at the right thing. Right here, S type. Uh, here's your 12 volt. And right here, we have a uh, core resistance of 720. Now, I'm not smart enough about relays to actually know if that makes a huge difference, but I've always read and then been told by other techs that you want to get your core resistance to be the same thing. And also, this is a this relay has a 200 milliwatt draw, not a 400 milliwatt draw. That's probably not. I mean, I, that's just the power it draws. So <clears throat> I don't, I don't think that a spec in particular matters. But the long and short of it is, is that the DS series is not currently available with the specifications that we need. However, if you jump over to eBay, they have them available. Supposedly new. They're Chinese. I mean, they could have been sucked out of other electronics or whatever, but. They probably are new because, like I said, they were discontinued in 2014 or 15. It's not that long ago. They haven't all been used up yet. So they are still available. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy um, some of these here. But also, I wanted to find a current uh, part number for it. And I was able to find that DigiKey, they suggest this part number for an Omron relay right here. Looking at this data sheet, this relay is, is also very similar to what we need. You can see this is, uh, that was the uh, ST40 USDC12. So right here, the, the uh, 40, uh, that's a low sensitivity uh, 400 milliwatt, just like the one that's in there. And scrolling on down here, uh, here's our low sensitivity models. 12 volt DC also, this one is 360 ohm coil resistance. So this has all the right stuff. And I'm going to scroll on down. Uh, yeah, right here it is right here. And just, I'll need to double check this footprint to be sure that's the same. I'm, I'm really, honestly, I'm sure it is. Uh, the pin layout is definitely the same. I've already looked looked at that i mean as far as numbering polarity should be straightforward but we can have a look at that too so i think that what i'm going to do in addition to ordering this part number uh, from this ebay seller i'm going to go ahead and order this omron here from uh, mauser i'm going to get a couple of these so because this uh of course, this eBay thing from China, this is going to take a while to get here. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and order some of these uh, G6A ones from uh, Mauser, and we'll install these in in the unit. So let's go ahead and uh, go over there and just, just take a measurement off this as well as look at the coil polarity. So I just happen to have here an original copy of the DEP5 service notes from Roland. This is not a photocopy. This is the actual original notes from Japan. Here, 
from my where is it at dp5 it's uh october 86 uh, which is going to be real close to when this unit came out. Uh, this unit has the same firmware 1.6 as that mentions it's current in this manual. So it has a schematic here. This is pretty cool. It has this huge MIDI implementation chart on the back. It's pretty sweet. And here's the here's our schematic can't <laughs> can't fit it on one page <laughs> uh, but we're gonna want to part we want to take a look at is right here okay so taking a look at this schematic you can see that that uh, this part right here is where they tap off the 15 volts for the relays and uh, for those of you that read schematics just note that these two uh, traces are actually drawn on here backwards there's an errata sheet for this that, that corrects that but anyways 15 volts uh, breaks off and, and goes up here uh, to the relays and you can see that they have them marked as uh, one and two these are the B sections. There's A and B. The B does the outputs, and on up here you can see right there where it's a, a uh, one and two or one A and two A. But just for the sake of the power, let's look at where they they illustrate it here. So the power comes in here on pin one. That's your positive. There's your relay coil. And you come out on a pin, what they call 16, even though there's not 16 pins in the relay, it's theoretically made to go into a 16 pin dip socket. So they call it 16, I guess. But anyways, it flows through one and it goes down and actually goes into pin one of the second relay, then flows back out. And that's how the relays are powered. So the positive does come in on one and we can take a look at that on the unit and just measure it, see if we get our 15 volts there. And looking at the unit itself, you can see that we have relay one, relay two. And if you look down here closely, you can see that this is pin one near the uh, back of the chassis, which is where the connectors are. And you have pin 16 opposite of it. Uh, that's the same thing over here. You can't see it, but pin 1 would be there and pin 16 there. So let's flip it over. So as I said, pin 1 of the relays was over here uh, near the connectors. So if we get on pin 1, we got uh, 15 volts there. That'll be relay 1 and relay 2 is here and also 15 volts. All right, now let's uh, take a look at this footprint on here. Okay, looking at this footprint, you can see that it's 7.62 between the coil pins and the rest of the pins. And it's also 7.62 between the pins in the long direction. So I have my calipers here set to 7.62 millimeters. Uh, here is the relay coil pins. So if I measure between here, it ought to be pretty much right on it. And it looks like it is. And also, we sit all the way across here this way. It's also 7.62 and really does look like it to me. Okay, that other measurement was between the signal pins and that one is 5.08 5.08 and looking down there yeah I mean that looks to me like 5.08 between these two it was also 5.08 millimeters so I don't think that there's anything else that we can do to 
make sure that this is the right relay. <laughs> um, so when a relay gets here, relays get here, we'll suck these out and install the new ones. Okay, we've got our relays in from Mauser. Check these out here. These are Yeah, those look like the right ones. There you can see the G6A ST40 US. There's the pen arrangement. Let's go ahead and uh, check the coil resistance on this. Okay. There we go, 353. It's very close to what's in there right now. All right. So let's go ahead and warm up the desoldering gun and we'll get these relays sucked out of there. Okay. See if we can suck these relays out of here. Hopefully this won't give me too much trouble. Sometimes these rolling boards are a pain. With these boards, you can often suck the solder out and it's still on the top side. There's uh, so much ground plane on them. Like that one. Probably this one as well. So I like to take some type of tool and see if I can move these at all those are just actually wanting to bend And there's our relay removed. Let me get this other one out of here. This one's not really willing to play ball. Oh, crap. So, I was hoping that wouldn't happen, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad that it did happen on camera. You see that right there? I just removed a pad off that. That's one thing about these rolling boards in particular is it's easy, easy to remove pads off of it. Um, so, we'll have to put that back on there. It looks like I'm thinking I'm going to need it to hold it, hold that relay in. 
Uh, uh, we'll check the top side just to make sure that pin's even used, but I believe it is. So unfortunately, as you can see here, we did lose a pad that we need. I do have the pad. It came off on the tip of the desoldering iron. That's one risk you always run working on these, these old boards. Uh, I think these Roland units are especially susceptible to that. There's basically uh, two ways you can remedy the situation. I typically try to just super glue it back on there. That generally works good enough, which is probably what I'll do with this because it's so small. If it was uh, more of a, a trace length, you can use an epoxy to put it back on there. But I think I'm probably just going to super glue this one. But before I do that, let's clean this area. Just clean it gently with a bit of isopropyl alcohol here. like to just scrub without really applying any pressure just to try to get it as clean as we can right through here. These rolling boards also, they typically have a, a lot of uh, flex residue. Like you can see all this crap along here. This is all built up. They really don't clean. I mean, you see it here too. And up here, they really don't seem to clean these boards after they solder them up um, so I really don't know <laughs> why they don't but sometimes when you go to try to clean these things you wind up cleaning needing to clean the whole board like you, you just make it stickier and stickier because of all the residue I mean look at that you see what it pulled up there that's pretty ridiculous that seems pretty clean to me so what I want to do is, since I we need to replace this pad, I actually need to let this dry for a while uh, just to make sure I'm able to glue uh, to that. Then we'll try putting the glue in that pad back on there. Honestly, if we can't get the pad to glue back down, it's probably still okay because uh, that is a plated through hole. There's a trace on the other side of the board that goes to that. It's probably still okay we can probably still get solder to get down in there and, and make a connection but nonetheless i'm going to try to get the pad to get back on there okay i just want to show you where i super glued this pad back down i mean that's literally all i did to it was just a little super glue and put it back down and then let it dry okay let's see if we can get these relays in here oh gotta get the right way around There's one. Okay, there's a little bit of a tight fit in there. There's two. I think I want to try to put some tape over these guys. I want to turn it over to solder it. So I'm literally just going to use this roll up piece of blue roll. And some tape and just tape it down to the switch over here. The top of the jacks. That'll give it enough pressure to keep it in there while we solder it. See if we can solder this these dudes in here.
one done. Here goes that pad that came off. Hopefully that made a good connection. <sighs> All right, looks good. Get this flux off. That way, let me try to also clean this area around these jacks where the factory left all the flux on there. Again, I'm just using some 99% isopropyl alcohol. Just gently rubbing this so not being heavy. Clean these up just a little bit just to have a closer look at what's going on. It's interesting now that I've cleaned all the gunk off, you can see like here and this connection here. These pads were actually lifted up from the factory. They've uh, pulled off. I mean, I guess someone could have come in here previously and worked on this, but this is typically what it looks like from the factory. So that makes me wonder if that's. Uh, it seems pretty solid, though. And I have checked these connections. They didn't, didn't seem any, like anything was really wrong with with the solder joints. The trouble with those jacks are internal. All right, let's put some power on this and see see if those relays throw properly. Okay, here's a topside look at the relays installed. So I'm going to go ahead and apply power, and obviously we won't be able to see them throw over, but let's listen and see if they throw together or, or do they have a delayed sequence like they had before. And, you know, I guess they could still. There could could be something else that's causing that it may not be the relays themselves but i'm uh, really hoping this will fix it so i'm going to go ahead and give it some power right now and let's listen yep they threw together and i'm just checking the front panel on it and i'm getting no error codes or anything so seems like it it's okay. Let me turn it on and do it one more time. And there they go. Yep, they threw exactly together. All right, cool. So I think now what I want to do actually is let's go plug this in and see what our three our three put signal is like now. Let's see if it cleaned it up at all or um, made it any better or if it's just totally the jacks are screwing us. So as you can see here, I'm plugged into my Vox amp. Everything is plugged in. The unit's turned off right now. The amp is on. And thankfully the amp didn't squeal at me or anything, so we know something's right. Let's see if there's any uh, bypass signal. So yeah, we got bypass. So let me turn the unit on and see what happens here. I 
Okay, just heard the relays trip. Let's see if there's reverb. And there is. seems to be working actually input signals a little hot that's a uh, one which is a hall Here's like a modulated hall. Super long tail lines. <laughs> Let's go to six. Six is kind of the same thing with the shorter tail. Yeah, it seems to be working. I'm going to mess with the jacks at the back now and see if they're cutting. You know what? That's doing a lot better. I mean, actually, that's not really even cutting out, so <laughs> maybe we fix this. Sorry about the crappy playing. I don't know, it's... I mean, I can hear a little bit of noise. Let me turn it on, off and on.
Cool. All right, let's go just inspect the the jacks a little closer, but the relays definitely seem to be repaired. I want to do one more test. Though. Let me turn this off. And I'm going to turn it back on and listen to see uh, if there's like a loud pop at the amp or whatever when the relays go. Nope. Very subtle. And just for shits and grins, let me try that one more time. Just turn the guitar on and see what it does. No, nope. very subtle. That's what the other ones do. So as you saw there, this thing is pretty much fixed at this point. Putting those new relays in there really solved most of the trouble with this thing. There, like I said, there were uh, intermittent contacts in, in the jacks, which were also affecting it quite a bit. Before I even started this video, I'd actually just sprayed a, a ton of of deoxid up into these jacks, and that seems to have actually done a lot to make them better because I can't really get them to uh, to cut out anymore right now. So generally this unit is, is fixed, but while I'm here, I just wanted to go ahead and try to service these jacks because I told you I had a way that I might be able to do it without removing them or trying to take them apart, which is nigh on impossible <laughs> to do that. I've tried it before and you, you just wind up destroying these jacks. So the idea being is that the contacts inside of these jacks are old and, and loose and not where they should be. So if we can just bend them back into place a little bit to where they make better contact with the plug that you stick in here is really all we got to do. So my idea is literally just to take a dental pick. This is just a Harbor Freight dental pick here and stick it into the, the jack this way to try to to try to just get in there and, and bend those contacts around, right? And I've actually already done it and it was successful. I'll show you in a minute how, how I actually got in there and stuff. So I used this dental pick and this had a more extreme bend in it right here. I wound up just uh, flattening it out, making it a little straighter. This is just, like I said, it's a Harbor Freight dental pick so it's not hardened tool steel or anything. It bent really easily. But this is pretty perfect to get in there. And I just bent the uh, the center contact for the tip, the signal. I just nudged it up a bit. I also got up under the ground and made it, you know, a little, gave it just a slight little bend. And you're just trying to do little bends in there, not much more, just to make it a little tighter. You guys won't be able to tell, but I can tell already by just sticking this in here that the contact is so much better. I mean, it, it didn't do that before. It just went in loosely. But now you get like a, a you know, a definite little snap to get in there, which is awesome. That means these are a lot tighter. So that seems to be a success. So let me give you a close-up shot of one of these jacks and show you how it got in there. All right, sorry about this. Not the best shot, but this is really the only way I can show you how I was able to uh, work on these jacks and or just service them. And if you look down in here, if I shine a flashlight in there, you can see that uh, little hump in there. That's the uh, center contact on the unit. And there's also on uh, the side that way, you can kind of see it there. Right there, that's one of the switches. There's another one that's uh, up that way. <laughs> uh, there's also, if you look carefully, you can see these bra these little bla uh, brass colored, copper colored strips in there. Uh, that's a ground. So basically what I did to this was I got up under those ground pieces there and just nudged them up a little bit with the dental pick just to make them a little tighter. And then I reached down in there with the dental pick 
like so. And I'm not actually going to do this because I'm looking through the camera and I can't do it through the camera. Plus it's just going to block. But I stuck it in there like that. Uh, sorry about that. If I can get, get more light in there somehow. And I stuck it in there like that and just, just turned this and got up under that and just pulled it a little bit uh, to try to to try to make it make better contact. And if you decide to do this with your DEP5, do not pull those very far. I mean, we're talking, uh, you're just trying to bend it like a thousands and bend it's not even the word. You're just trying to nudge that thing a little bit to just to get it to make a little bit better contact. You gotta remember that th these are switching jacks. They're, when you insert a jack in here, uh, it either makes or breaks contacts and you don't wanna bend those. They're, they're basically like leaf switches is, is what they amount to. They're just thin pieces of metal. And you don't wanna bend those so far that you lose the switching ability of these jacks. But anyways, that's how I did it, is with the dental pick and just reaching in there. That's really the only way to sort of service these jacks. All right, there we go. We got us a fully working Roland DEP5. I think I paid less than 120 for this on eBay, which is excellent. These things, you can get them as cheap as 75 on up to a few hundred dollars. So I think anything 100, slightly over 100, anything less than 150 certainly is great. I wouldn't pay more than about 150 for one unless it was an excellent condition. Uh, otherwise, this is what might happen. I mean, this thing looked to be in great condition. eBay ads, but you can't tell. I mean, this thing had quite a few problems when we got it, didn't it? So, but now it works. Let's hit the power. There you go. It's fully working. Memory works. All of our knobs are in working order. Let's change a few things here. No issues there. And also importantly, because we changed the battery, if we try to uh, move on here, you'll see that we get a blinking starting. And that's telling you that, oh, you changed some some stuff here. Do you want to save it in memory is basically what it's asking you. And how you do that is you, you push in on the right button there. And then you push in on the memory number button on both sides of it at the same time. So you push in right and then go like, that and it flashes and now that's stored our changes in the memory and you'll see it'll let me move up to three without flashing at me then when i come back i've got the same memory stored and if you want to see what's in memory you can hit the value button over here which is off screen and it's telling you number seven that's knob number seven counting from here one two three four five six seven it's telling you that's the setting that it's at. Knob six, that's knob six, and and so forth. So all the way down to knob one is going to be your EQ or chorus setting low. But yeah, I don't want to go into instructing you how to use this, but that's it. That's the DEP5 fixed and working. Thanks for watching.